Let's re-enter the judgment hall of Caiaphas. Matthew 26, 63 says, But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Silence in the trial. Caiaphas sits on his throne of authority. Can you see the man? Down below before him is Jesus. His hands are shackled behind his back. His pale face shows the red bruise caused by the guard of Annas who struck him. The Sanhedrin waits for an answer. If Jesus admits that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God, he will die. And remember, Jesus is human. He also had fears like you and me. He didn't look forward to dying. If he denies it, he will live and go free. There are times when we need to give an answer. Speaking the truth, we are in trouble. Speaking a lie, we are safe. You've been there. I've been there. Do what Jesus did. Truth is more precious than life itself. 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Three steps. Secret of a Christian experience. Revelation 21, 27. For there shall by no means enter anything that defiles. This is heaven. Or causes an abomination or a lie, even if it's a white lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. We cannot allow a lie of a few seconds to forfeit an eternity of unending happiness peace and contentment. So if you're a liar, a habitual one or an occasional one, ask God to give you victory over lying. It brings peace when you speak the truth. Let me tell you about the lie that haunted me for many years. I was a little boy, seven years, I think. Second year at school, and I failed. I was an academic failure. My dad was, was very upset. He's an intellectual. He was. But I told the lie. I said, the teacher is against our church. And that's why she failed me. And she said to the children, you can mock him because of his beliefs. He took me out of that school and I went to a Christian school, but I had to take two trains, this little boy. A steam train and an electric train to eventually come to the church school. And then from the station, I had to walk to the school. So I started when it was midnight almost. <laughs> Came back very late. Eventually, I started to get uh, nightmares. Conductor walking without legs. So my mom said, take him out. And I wanted to tell them that, sorry, I, I told a lie, but I, I couldn't. I went, by the way, I, I, I succeeded to pass the second year schooling. When I went to high school, it still bothered me. Eventually I got married, but this thing haunted me. I told them a lie. I bought my first car, the leopard old thing. But I was joyous, but this thing haunted me. And then eventually I bought a beautiful car. And I thought the happiness of the new car would drown my conscience, but it didn't. At 10 o'clock that night, 
I got out of bed, or 11, I can't remember the exact time, and I drove all the way to my parents, getting there early in the morning. They were shocked. What are you doing here? I said, I told you a lie when I was a little boy. <laughs> you know, they embraced me. They forgave me. If you've told a lie, like I did, and it worries you, the devil wants to keep you away from a wonderful experience. Go and confess your sins. You know, the advocate Jesus Christ only works on confessed sins. And he's the best advocate in the universe. He always wins the case of the penitent, repentant sinner. Proverbs 12, 22, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Hmm. Don't be an abomination to him by lying. But those who deal truthfully are his delight. Let us be his delight. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper. If you want to be spiritually prosperous, don't cover your sin. But whosoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy and happiness and peace of mind. You've got, if you've got to make a thing right, don't delay like I did for many years. Take up the phone or send an email or whatever. But let your conscience be clear. Matthew 26, 30, 63. KFS speaking. His voice echoes in that judgment hall. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. If he says yes, that awaits inhuman abuse and a humiliating death on the cross of Calvary. All eyes are on Jesus. The Sanhedrin waits intense for an answer. 64. Jesus said to him, It is as you said, I am the Son of the living God. Shock waves went through the trial. What happened when Jesus revealed this tremendous truth? For a moment, the divinity of Christ flashed through his guise of humanity. So he revealed himself as the Son of God. What a moment. I'm looking forward to during the thousand years of investigation to listen to this video of what happened there. The high priest quailed before the penetrating eyes of the Savior, seeing divine glory. That look seemed to read his hidden thoughts and burn into his heart. Never in afterlife did he forget that searching glance of the persecuted Son of God. May purity also flash through us when we speak the truth in love. But besides speaking the truth, Jesus added something on which the judges could ponder and give serious thought. Verse 64. He speaks to the audience, to the judges, to the people. Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He proclaimed the second coming of Christ in all his divine glory. There awaits a surprise for the people who presided in this trial and crucified him. <coughs> <clears throat> Matthew 26, 64. In these words, Christ presented the reverse of the scene then taking place. This is what we see now, he says. But you will see something else one day. He, the Lord of life and glory, would be seated at God's right hand. He would be the judge of all the earth. 
and from his decision there could be no appeal. Then every secret thing would be set in the light of God's countenance, and the judgment be passed on every man according to his deeds. The words of Christ startled the high priest. The thought that there was to be a resurrection of the dead when all would stand at the bar of God to be rewarded according to their works was a thought of terror to Caiaphas the high priest. He did not wish to believe that in future he would receive sentence according to his works. They rushed before his mind as a panorama, the scenes of the final judgment. For a moment he saw the fearful spectacle of the graves giving up their dead, where the secrets he had hoped were forever hidden. For a moment he felt as if standing before the eternal judge, whose eye, which sees all things, was reading his soul, bringing to light mysteries supposed to be hidden with the dead. Lesson to be learned from Caiaphas? How do I treat Christ when I'm watching certain TV programs? If you want to take away the relish for God's word, sit and look at television. It's miserable. Do you consult him in the things I do or do I act independently from him? We should ask him in everything we do for his guidance. Because we are so stupid, we cannot see tomorrow. He sees tomorrow. Consult him in whatever you do. Don't live independently from him. There is a cell by date coming for our planet when it will go up in fire. Have you ever bought stuff sold by date? This planet has got an expiry date. The day is coming when Christ will come in all his glory, in the Father's divine glory, and in the glory of all the angels. The cosmos will become dim in the light of this glorious appearing when God comes down one of these days to take us home. He's coming to separate the sheep from the goats. So please, embrace him with obedience to his revealed will. If you want to have a close relationship to Christ, be obedient to all his revealed truths. Through obedience, the bond between him and you will become stronger and stronger and stronger. It takes a few minutes to say no to temptation but you have a, a lifelong satisfaction. If you yield to temptation, you may have a lifelong regret. 65, 66, Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, You have spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? Speaking to the audience, they answered and said, He is deserving of death. Can you appreciate the trauma Jesus experienced when he heard that he was to die? Let us always remember that he became flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone. I've spoken to an man who, who used to work where they hanged people. And he tells me so many people faint when the death sentence is announced. Something traumatic happens to them. And Christ had a human nature. He was traumatized when he heard that he was to die. It is the most frightening of all verdicts. 
You can read the case histories of these people. Jesus experienced the emotions and fear and desperation of all those who were condemned to die. He was there. Wherever fully, will we ever fully appreciate the emotional price he paid in order to save us from our sins? Did the verdict of the Sanhedrin that he is deserving death carry any truth? The first answer is no. He did not do anything to deserve death. Second answer is yes. He deserves death. He deserves to be put to death. Why? Because of you and me. Because he took my sins upon himself. An act that we will only appreciate when we get to heaven. Christ was treated as we deserve. That we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share. That we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes, we are healed. The third illegal trial lasted from three o'clock to four o'clock in the morning. The Sanhedrin had pronounced Jesus worthy of death, but it was contrary to the Jewish law to try a prisoner by night. In legal condemnation, nothing could be done except in the light of day and before a full session of the council. Jesus was taken from the place where the Sanhedrin condemned him to death to a cell, a prison. The palace of the high priest surrounded an open court which the soldiers and the multitude had gathered. So, here we have another setting. Listen to the way in which he was treated at this court. Mark 14, 65. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him. Spitting, blindfolding, and beating. And say to him, prophesy. And the officers stuck him with the palms of their hands. On the way to the cell, to the prison, this is what he received. Can you see what is happening here? The ignorant rabble had seen the cruelty with which he was treated before the council. And from this they took license to manifest all the satanic elements of their nature. Christ's very nobility and godlike bearing goaded them to madness. His meekness and his innocence, his majestic patience, filled them with hatred born of Satan. The devil was there. <coughs> Mercy and justice were trampled upon. Never was a criminal treated in so inhumane a manner as was the Son of God. 65. Then some began to spit on him and blindfolded him and to beat him and to say to him, Prophesy! And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. What was the first thing they did to Jesus? This did not only happen once. The verb emptain says they spat him in disgust and kept on spitting him in the face. His hands were tied beneath his back. He couldn't wipe the spittle. So they came to him, mocked him and spat him in the face. And the next one would come and did the same. Can you see him standing there? 
Can you dis- see this disgusting way in which they treat the Son of God who made heavens and earth? And Jesus did not retaliate. This unbelievable, cruel, disgusting humiliation was predicted 700 years before by the prophet Isaiah. 56. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. They came and ripped out his beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. He didn't turn away. He took it all. What a humiliation. As I said before, in their thinking, humiliation was worse than pain. Then some began to spit on him and blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy, and the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. What is happening here? What happened after they blindfolded Jesus? One of the Jerusalem scum hit him, hits him on the f- in the face. It was meant to kill him. And then the coward has the audacity asked Jesus to prophesy who he was. What treatment. I was shocked when I checked the verb in Greek. They kept on beating him and beating him and beating him. It's the participle. They just keep on doing this. What did that face look like? Can you see those cowards just keep on pounding a blindfolded man, a man whose hands is bound, a lot of cowards. Jesus was the hero. What a price he paid for our sins. Don't ever think he cannot forgive you. He's paid it all. Falsely accused, then slapped in the face, spat in the face, mocked. The Geneva Bible says, the sergeant smote him with their rods, old translation. So not only by hand, they also had the rods. They smote him. Does he really love us so much that he suffered so much? You'll never know how much he loves you. Was ever love so strong? Was ever crime so wrong? When Jesus suffered long for all my sin, he saw my greatest need, became my friend indeed. Through him I have been freed of all my sin. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected by man, by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. He wouldn't want to look at him. His face was too beaten up, full of spit, standing there. For surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. And afflicted. What did he look like when they removed the cloth with which they blindfolded him? In the greatest classic written on the life of Christ, the Desire of Ages, page 710, says, I read these few words, Jesus was taken to the guard room. Now this is interesting. Where was the guard room? This is what the Bible says. Can archaeology help us concerning the location, the venue of the guard room? When did this happen? And did archaeologists found the place? The trial of Christ before the Sanhedrin was conducted between 3 and 4 in the morning. At 4 o'clock, one could see the, the soft light of the new day And by 5.30, the sun appeared on the horizon. This is just to give you the time framework. 
We're not certain for how long Jesus was abused by the spiritual leaders and the scum of Jerusalem. Neither do we know exact, the exact time he spent in the guard room or the cell or dungeon. What we do know is that Jesus went through the most severe crisis in history. Let's walk up the steps and let me show you the guard room, the dungeon, the cell in which Jesus was placed. What do we see on these steps on which Jesus was taken to the palace of Caiaphas? And I took a picture of this. Can you see this? A depiction of how they dragged him and treated him. When you visit this place, <clears throat> you read this caption, it says, underground caves, guard room, as mentioned by the desire of ages. They also call it the sacred pit, the dungeon. So, desire of ages refers to guard room. Archaeologists calls it the pit or the dungeon. Let's go down. I remember the time when I was taken there by a Palestinian who was converted to Christianity and he took me there and it was so special. It was long ago and he explained to me what happened down here. Now look at these two holes. What do they mean? And this minister told me that the hands of the victim when he was judged by the Sanhedrin were put into these holes and at the back was a solid rock. And then something cruel happened. 26 lashes on his chest. 13 on the left and 13 on the right. Can you see it? You know, I stood there and I just explained how it worked. But the lashes on his chest did not compare to the lashes Peter gave him when he denied him three times a few minutes before. But the lashes over his heart of love was more severe. So, here I'm standing right in this guard room, this pit, this dungeon. And you can read Psalms 88. They've put it there for us in different languages. It's a messianic psalm. I'm reading to you what happened to Jesus. 88 verse 3. For my soul is full of trouble. And my life draws near to the grave. He was starting to die. Verse 4, I'm counted with those who go down to the pit. And here we are in the pit. I'm like a man who has no strength. You know, 26 lashes on his chest. When they did this, they ripped out pieces of bone and flesh. So his chest was just big one bloody wound sitting down in this dungeon. Verse 6, You've laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths, pitch dark, with these bleeding wounds. Verse 7, Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves. Verse 8, You've put away my acquaintances far from me, Peter, the disciples. You've made me an abomination to them. I'm shut up and I cannot get out. Humanly speaking, he wanted to get out of this dark dungeon. While reading these verses down there, I thought of his physical condition. It must have been terrible, horrendous. The God who enjoyed the freedom of eternal spaces suffers claustrophobia 
in this cell, in this dungeon, in this guard room. His face is swollen and bleeding from the many facial blows. His hands still tied behind his back. And my sins and your sins are breaking his heart. He has excruciating pain and sorrow is breaking his heart. Why couldn't he have died in Gethsemane? He shed his blood there. He came to identify with the millions of martyrs who died in cold, lonely dungeons. In my ecological research, I visited some of these places. Nuremberg in Germany, catacombs in Alexandria and Rome, the Waldensians, Toropolitsi, the Angrongna Valley. When we were on the brink of suicide, were you there? He was there. He didn't want to live. Cluster of galaxies. Millions of light years apart. He suffered claustrophobia for us, for us, so that we could one day enjoy the immeasurable spaces of eternity. We have to thank him for every crumb of bread, for every drop of water. Calvary paid it all. Let's not look in an indifferent way to the price he paid for us. Was ever love so strong? Was ever crime so wrong? When Jesus suffered long for all my sin, he saw my greatest need, became my friend indeed. Through him I have been freed of all my sin. He paid it all. Oh, what a Savior is mine. In him, God's mercies combine. His love can never decline. And he loves me. He loves you. I thank God for the precious gift of his son. For God so loved the world, you and me, that he gave this gift. I don't have to be punished the Punishment of eternal death. Jesus paid the price. I thank him for forgiving me by taking all my sins upon himself. And the more I look at his perfect life, the more guilty I feel, the more, more lost I feel. I pray for grace to deny my sinful self, to take up my cross and follow him. I invite you, my dear friend, in giving ourselves anew to the one who suffered and died for us, the only one that really cares for us. He paid such a price. If you would be lost one day, he'll be lonesome throughout eternity. Don't do it to him. Break with your sins and live a victorious life through his power. Father in heaven, we've got no idea of the pain Jesus went through to save us from eternal destruction. Help us by beholding him that we should become changed. In Jesus' name, amen.